morning. We're, welcome, we're delighted to welcome Omsio Nam Kun, who, uh, who is at Columbia Business School. And he'll be speaking about analyzing the sensitivity of causal findings under the distribution of shifts. Thanks, Saeed. Uh, thanks a lot for, to the organizers for exciting workshop and uh, invitation to speak here. All right, so I'm going to. Uh, talk about how we can uh, use ideas from distributional robustness and combine this with modern prediction methods to analyze the reliability and sensitivity of causal findings, okay? So uh, for those of you who are familiar with some of these worst case procedures, right, they've certainly received a fair amount of attention in the past uh, two decades, first in, in operations research and, and now uh, it's a burgeoning community in, in ML. And uh, the truth is a, a, a lot of these worst case procedures, they tend to produce fairly conservative solutions and models if you try to directly optimize it because it really requires you to commit to a particular somewhat contrived uh, worst case region. But I do think that a lot of these procedures are actually quite sensible and uh, practical when it comes to evaluating the robustness of decisions and interventions. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. So, of course, uh, for us to uh, make decisions that are reliable and effective, we need to base them off of causal relationships rather than read off of uh, spurious correlations. And uh, in the backdrop of this rather classical topic of causality is the fact that we've seen uh, striking advances in, in uh, large-scale prediction methods recently, right? And, and they've certainly been driving progress in a range of different fields. Now, the decision-making problems that we actually want to solve in practice, they don't neatly fall into a, uh, a prediction setup because we're interested in counterfactuals, right? What would have happened to this patient had this patient not taken a drug, okay? And if you naively try to use a prediction model, it can lead to all kinds of weird conclusions. For example, if you're studying the relationship between housing demand and rent, right? Then a naive prediction model is gonna predict high demand whenever rent is high, because this is what you see in big cities. But obviously this is nonsensical given our basic intuition. But nevertheless, we still want to leverage these uh, large scale curve fitting tools and this is going to be a major theme in today's talk. Okay. Now, inferring causality is, of course, quite challenging. It's pretty easy to end up with uh, spurious uh, conclusions. With that, uh, we've perhaps arrived at the most important slide of this talk. Okay. So it turns out if you want to live longer, you should go to museums more. Now, in this clearly nonsensical result, right, uh, there were unobserved confounders, for example, wealth, that simultaneously makes you more likely to go to museums and it also allows you uh, better access to good healthcare and makes you more likely to live longer, right? So it's a prime example of selection on unobservables. Is that a real article? It is. It's a real New York Times article uh, based on a research paper that claimed to do careful analysis. So it goes to show uh, how difficult it is to uncover causal relationships. So today I'm gonna talk about how we can avoid these types of spurious conclusions and by analyzing the reliability of these causal findings. Okay. And again, a big theme is gonna be how we can leverage and repurpose large scale prediction methods towards inferring causality. All right, so primarily for just for simplicity, uh, for the sake of this talk, I'm gonna focus on the case of binary actions. We're gonna have uh, action one, which I'm gonna call the treatment arm, and action zero, which I'm gonna call the control arm, okay? So the treatment arm is usually gonna be some complex policy proposal recommended by experts. Control arm, usually the status quo. Okay. And a, a lot of the insights that we develop today are actually going to extend to multi-action sequential decision-making problems. Now, to be able to write down the counterfactual states of the world, I'm going to use what's known as the potential outcomes framework. And this allows me to write down what the outcomes would have been had I used a different treatment option. Right? So I'm going to use X as usual to denote my features, covariates, Z to denote the observed treatment assignments. It's going to be a binary variable. And I'm going to use y1 and y0 to denote the potential outcomes, right? And the important tidbit here is that you as the analyst, you only get to observe y1 if z is equal to 1, if this person was treated, and y0 if z is equal to 0, right? In particular, you never, ever observe the counterfactual outcome. This is also known as banded feedback in, in certain circles, okay? Now, given this notation, the standard S-demand is uh, usually the average treatment effect which is simply the mean difference between y1 and y0. So here I'm unpacking it a bit further and I'm writing it as the difference between the conditional means, right? And I'm calling the first conditional mean mu1, the second one mu0, right? And the difference mu of x. So mu of x is a personalized notion of the treatment effect for an individual represented by a feature vector x. 
It's often called the conditional average treatment effect, Kate for short. Okay? And the AT is simply an average of mu of x right, over the study population Px. It's actually pretty important that you understand the notation here, so let me pause for two seconds in case you have any uh, clarification questions. We're in good? Great. Now, to avoid the types of selection bias that we saw, right, the, the museum examples, um, the best way to go, of, obviously, is to randomize your treatment assignments, right? So if you uh, flip a random coin to decide your treatments, then your potential outcomes are independent of this observed treatment assignment. And what this allows you to do is here, I have this mean difference, the definition of AT, right? It allows me to condition on z equals to 1 for y1 and z equals to 0 for y0. Now, the seemingly trivial mathematical step is actually the crux of causal inference in that we're using the underlying structure of the problem to turn a unobservable counterfactual quantity into something that I can actually observe and estimate using my data. Right, I observe y1 when z is, equals, z is equal to 1, y0 when z is equal to 0. Okay. But of course, there's a lot of problems where we can't randomize our treatment decision. We can't randomize school assignments for the general public. We can't randomize uh, whether or not we're going to sell uh, a particular drug to, to the general population. We can't randomize most economic policies. But historically, a lot of important findings have been made on observational data alone, right, where you don't get to randomize your treatment decisions. For example, citrus fruit have been found to be a cure for scurvy in the 1700s, and insulin has been found to be an uh, effective treatment for diabetes in, in the 1920s, long before anyone started thinking about uh, randomized trials. But these observational results, they need to be contextualized, and they certainly must be viewed with more skepticism, lest we fall trapped to the types of spurious conclusions that we just saw. Now, for observational studies, there is a key mathematical assumption that still allows me to uncover the causal effect. This is called the no unobserved confounding condition. Right? Nominally, it simply says that the potential outcomes are independent of the treatment assignment if you condition on X. In words, what this means is that, say, the doctors who are prescribing these uh, medicine, right, they have access to the same information X that you as the analyst have access to. And if you condition on it, their decisions are as good as random. In particular, they're not prescient. They don't know what's going to happen to the patient. It's a very strong assumption that's frequently violated. But under this assumption, you can essentially try to account for selection bias. And there's a number of different approaches for doing this. The first approach is called uh, important sampling, also known as inverse quality weighting. Okay, so the problem here is that the treated units, they don't look like the entire population, right? People who go to museums more, they tend to be wealthier, so they don't look like the overall population. So now you're just gonna reweight the treated units using X information so that they look like the entire population. Right, and it turns out the right importance weight to use is inversely proportional to the probability of being treated given x. So if I can estimate this quantity accurately, say using a logistic regression model, then this approach is going to work well. Okay? Now, the second approach is simpler. It's called the direct method or a plug-in method, where now I'm going to, okay, here I'm just going to focus on the case of estimating the mean of y1 because the y0 case is symmetric. Now, under my known observed confounding condition, I can write it down as the expectation of this conditional mean, right, y1 given x and z equals to 1. Now, I certainly observe y1 when z is equal to 1. So this inner expectation, I could simply fit a regression model, right? I take all the treated units and just use x to predict y. Very simple. And then I can just take that regression model, average it to get my final estimator. So this is a plug-in method, a direct method. Now, I actually want to combine the best of both worlds, right? Here, this method is going to work well if I can predict the outcomes accurately. The previous method, it works well if I can estimate these importance weights accurately, okay? And the way I'm going to combine this is by first carefully thinking about what is the statistical error of this quantity, right? This uh, plug-in method, okay? So here I have this statistical functional, and p hat is my empirical distribution, right? So this is my statistical error. Now, if I write it this way, you're tempted to take the Taylor expansion of this statistical functional, and this is what you get, right? The first order Taylor expansion. Now, of course, the underlying quantity is a probability measure, an infinite dimensional object, right? So you can, if you want, you can use the right functional uh, and analytic tools to write this as an integral. But if you don't want to care about this today, just pretend like they're transposes, okay? Now, 
the nice thing about this first order Taylor expansion is that this first term, it quantifies the first order statistical error of my plug-in estimator. So if I can estimate this quantity using my data, then I can simply use it to explicitly correct my plug-in estimator. Okay, so this is called a de-biased estimator. And the great thing about this idea is that then my de-biased estimator, by definition, enjoys second order error rates. Everyone see this? And this is gonna be, a, this is an idea that I'm gonna be relying on heavily throughout the talk. Any questions so far? So I take a first order Taylor expansion of my statistical estimator, use it to correct my plug-in approach. Okay, pretty simple. So then by definition, I only have second order terms in my Taylor expansion. Now, if I apply this to my uh, particular statistical functional, the mean of y1, then I get what's known as a doubly robust estimator. And it's actually uh, one of the most scalable estimators for the causal effect, okay? So here, in addition to this regression function that I fitted, right, now I also have the residuals of this regression function, which I'm reweighting by the probability of you being treated given x. This is known as the propensity score. And I'm reweighting my residuals. And this funny formula I got using this first order Taylor expansion, okay? So it turns out this, uh, if you use this formula, my estimator, it's, it really combines the best of both worlds, right? So it's accurate as long as I can predict the outcomes well or predict this important sampling ratio well, right? The propensity scores, okay? And by virtue of this debiasing idea, it's actually insensitive to any errors in these nuisance estimates in these infinite dimensional quantities, right? So I'm usually gonna fit these using ML-based uh, methods and they tend to be fairly unstable on parts of the covariate space, right? And the great thing about uh, this estimator is that it's actually somewhat insensitive to any errors that these ML-based uh, estimators might have. Okay. So this is gonna be the main uh, mode of causal analysis that I'm gonna uh, be extending today, okay? Because it's usually the most scalable estimator for the causal effect. So this is uh, my five minute review of uh, causal inference. Uh, any, any questions so far? Do you mean like only for X's where you can do either one of these estimates well? Ah, um, you can show, yes, more refined theorems of that nature. Uh, but it, yeah, you essentially get uh, results where the error of this estimator uh, it has a product form where it's an error of this one and error of that one. Any other questions? Good. All right, so now the implicit and the explicit assumptions that we require to uncover the causal effect, of course, they're often outright false in practice, right? So one of the implicit assumptions that we often make is that the study population is actually representative of the overall population of interest, right? But of course, data collection is often quite messy. Uh, it's done on a, a handful of geospatial locations, often at a particular point in time, right? So this leads to all kinds of unanticipated uh, covariate shifts down the line. So here, uh, I'm illustrating using this plot how even for carefully designed randomized uh, trials, how the study population may not be representative of the overall population of interest. So this is a plot from Tipton et al's paper, uh, which analyzed uh, 34 different studies in education from 2011 to 2015. And here you see that the, uh, there is a salient difference between a typical study population and the national school population, right? A typical study population is drawn from very large school districts, whereas these large school, distri school districts are actually quite rare in the nation. And this is largely out of administrative uh, convenience because when you're designing the study, you actually need to get approval from the district level administrators. Okay. And another really big problem is of course that our data collection systems, they inherit uh, the types of biases and power structures that we see throughout society. So uh, in medicine, for example, it's well known that clinical trials are heavily centered around uh, Caucasian groups. So out of more than 10,000 cl cancer clinical trials funded by the National Cancer Institute, less than 5% uh, of the participants were non-white, which is quite striking. And as a result, uh, even the largest clinical trials, they tend to lose external validity. One good example of this is the Accord and the uh, SPRINT trials, which looked at the uh, effect of treatments to lower blood pressure on cardiovascular diseases. 
and they had the exact opposite conclusions. And experts couldn't explain the mechanism, the reason behind this difference, even ex post. Okay? And of course, uh, the X shift problem, it's a, a par problem for both observational studies and randomized trials. But of course, for observational studies, the problem is even more stark, right? Uh, so this no unobserved confounding condition that allowed us to correct for selection bias, this is often outright false. For example, a few years ago, you might remember uh, that there was this study which actually came out of Columbia at the time, which looked at the Israeli courts, and they found that uh, judges, they tend to be more lenient right after taking a break. So naturally, a lot of people were very concerned about this. Right? But then another group of authors came about, and they argued that the original analysis may have, in fact, overlooked a bunch of uh, variables. For example, in the Israeli judicial system, uh, defendants without representation or without good representation, they tend to go last in any given session. So this might be the reason you're seeing these effects. And this is, of course, a uh, very prominent problem in medicine, where doctors, they base their treatment decisions uh, using visual observations and conversations with patients all the time. But these observations, they're not properly recorded into the electronic medical records, at least at the resolution of the current systems. Right? And drugs are preferentially prescribed to people who can actually tolerate their side effects and for whom it's going to be the most effective one. But despite these violations of these assumptions, right, we still want our causal findings and the resulting decisions to be robust. So today I'm going to talk about a uh, distributionally robust approach where we're going to first posit a set of plausible violations to these assumptions, and we're going to take the worst case causal effect. Okay? And the idea here is that if the findings of your study can withstand these types of worst case analysis, then you probably have a fairly robust result. Right? So for example, Think about this red line as the causal effect of interest. I'm going to posit some set of distribution shifts over which I'm going to take the worst case region at the population level. And if I can say with my data, with say 95% confidence that this worst case bound is still meaningfully different from zero, this instills some confidence in this causal finding. Okay? But of course, in practice, you never know how much distribution shift you expect to suffer from. So a useful heuristic is to look at increasing magnitude choose of uh, the distribution shift, and then look at the threshold magnitude value where your worst case bound crosses zero. Okay? And then you can now interpret this uh, threshold magnitude value. If it's really small, then you should be very concerned. Right? You have a very brittle finding that's easily invalidated even under small distribution shifts. If it's large, then that instills some confidence in your result. So it's a way to contextualize your results. Okay? Now, one thing I should mention here is that uh, methodologically, we're going to look at the scalable doubly robust estimator for the ATE, and we're going to analyze the sensitivity of this particular estimator. Okay, so that's going to be the main methodological meat in the work I'm going to talk about. All right. So I'm going to generalize this approach to distribution shifts. Okay, so let's dive right in. I'm going to now talk about covariate shift. Sorry. Because originally it felt like you wanted to uh, understand the, uh, uh, are you just trying to understand a binary uh, problem? Yes, here I'm, I'm mostly just focusing sim for simplicity on a binary intervention scenario. Is there an effect on that? Yes, like so that? I'm, I'm taking the difference between the two outcomes, and if that's positive, okay. in this case, I'm happy. Or in this neg negative, then I'm happy. All right. Now, First, I'm going to talk about X shifts, right, queer shifts. And this is particularly problematic if your, heter uh, if your treatments are heterogeneous across covariates. And of course, this is often the case in practice, right? For example, in medicine, your treatment effect varies alongside covariates like demographics, uh, comorbidities, uh, any uh, drugs that you take alongside the treatment of interest, access to healthcare, stuff like this. Right? Now, at this point, you might think that, okay, what if I just use any ML-based approach to directly estimate this personalized notion of the treatment effect? And if I know exactly how the distribution shift is going to pan out, this is essentially all the information I need to make good decisions. But now I'm going to argue that it's actually pretty challenging to do either. Okay? So as we all know, these ML models, they tend to be extremely unstable on certain parts of the covariate space, especially when the uh, data inherits the biases and the power structures that we see throughout society. 
Uh, so if you naively use an ML method, you often end up with an extremely underpowered decision. Now, as an alternative to this, one useful heuristic might be to look at a finite set of handful of predefined demographic groups, and then to measure the treatment effect on each group. So this is certainly a fairly reasonable uh, heuristic, and a lot of people use this. But this can also be often challenging because there's a lot of intersectionality in your treatment effects. Right? Your treatment effect is often heterogeneous, and it's determined by a combination of multiple factors, like your race, income, age, gender, and in medical scenarios, your genetic information as well. Right? So as one illustration of this, uh, on the right, I'm looking at the effect of enrolling in Medicaid on doctor's office utilization. I'm going to expand on this example in a bit. Right? But here, you can see that I'm looking at the treatment effect on two demographic groups that are identical, but they only differ in terms of their level of education. But these small differences in the demographic groupings can actually result in fairly large differences in the treatment effect. So it goes to show how difficult it is to define these subgroups a priori without doing the analysis. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about a, a worst case approach. We're going to automatically consider an infinite set of subpopulations, and we're going to measure the worst off subpopulation, uh, measure the treatment effect on the worst off subpopulation. So formally, I'm going to say that a distribution Q over the features X is a subpopulation if there exists a uh, demographic variable, demographic proportion, A, which is a number between 0 and 1, and another distribution Q prime, such that if you mix Q and Q prime according to this demographic proportion, then you recover the underlying study population. Pictorially, this purple curve is a subpopulation in the sense that if you mix this purple curve with this gray curve according to the demographic proportion equal to 20%, then you exactly recover the underlying study population. Now, given a study population, there's, of course, an infinite number of different uh, subpopulations that you can consider. Right? So here's another example, another one, another one, and another one. Okay. So I'm going to consider a whole lot of different subpopulations. But because I can't look at arbitrary subpopulations, right, I'm going to look at some user-specified number alpha. This is akin to the robustness radius. And I'm going to look at all subpopulations that comprise alpha fraction of my study population. Say if alpha is 20%, this means that the subpopulation comprise at least 20% of my study. Okay? So with this, I can now define the worst case treatment effect over these subpopulations, which is simply the supremum over this Kate function right, across subpopulations that comprise an alpha fraction of my study. Okay, so this worst case notion, it's agnostic to demographic groupings, and it automatically accounts for intersectionality latent in these uh, heterogeneous treatment effects. Okay. All right, I think you just said, can you explain it again? What is this notation QX? Good, so it, sim it means that this subpopulation comprise more than alpha fraction of my study population. So I defined Q as a mixture proportion, so here I'm simply saying that this mixture weight needs to be larger than some number uh, alpha, say 20%. Thanks. So Q is a proper distribution that integrates to 1. Yes, so I am heavily abusing notation and saying that a probability measure is larger than some number 20%. And this is my shorthand for saying the subpopulation comprises of at least 20% of your data. A is greater than zero yes, point a, two? A, a is greater than alpha. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Did you say these subpopulations were defined on the front by the user, or that you're just going to you're going to consider like any possible subpopulation? Good. Um, so here, the fraction alpha is fairly interpretable. Um, so you can imagine a scenario where you select one or two alphas and evaluate the worst case. But in my demonstrations, I'm going to look at a scenario where I look at increasingly smaller values of alpha. So now this worst case measure becomes larger and larger. And then I'm going to try to contextualize the results that way. That's a good question. So a lot of these worst case tools, right, they're useful insofar as this worst case region is actually interpretable. And this one, I think it's, it's still somewhat conservative, but it's fairly interpretable because alpha is a, really the fraction of the subpopulation. All right. Now, this worst case measure, it involves a infinite dimensional maximization problem. So let's think now think about how to make this more tractable. If you think about who, is the, who are the people who suffer the largest treatment effect, 
Well, it's just simply going to be defined by this tail population of the Kate function mu of x. Okay? So this lemma uh, formalizes this, and it says that this worst case treatment effect is simply equal to this uh, mean of mu of x truncated by this h of x function. And this function is equal to 1 over alpha if your uh, heterogeneous treatment effect is large enough and 0 otherwise. For those of you who know uh, what a risk measure is, this is simply the conditional value at risk. And the here, compared to the literature, I'm taking the C bar of an unknown function that I actually have to estimate. Okay, so we're in a semi parametric statistical scenario. Okay, so now I'm going to use any ML method of my choosing to estimate these infinite dimensional noisance parameters. Right, this outcome models and this propensity scores, the probability of being treated, give next. I'm going to combine them using this debiased idea, debiasing idea, to come up with a final estimator, which is a single number, this worst case bound. Okay? Fundamentally, I care about a single number, but I actually need to estimate these infinite dimensional quantities to estimate this single number. Right? Now, these infinite dimensional quantities, these ML models, they tend to be unstable. So I'm going to use this debiasing idea to come up with an estimator for my single number. And it's going to inherit a lot of the nice properties of the doubly robust estimator that I started with. In particular, we can show that our d bias estimator, right, it enjoys these typical central limit rates even when these infinite dimensional nuisance parameters converge at a slower rate of convergence. Obviously, I'm hiding a lot of things under the rug, but this is the, the gist of, of what's going on. Okay? And these results are what allows us to generate a confidence interval on these worst case bounds. Okay? Now, to complement uh, these uh, methodological results, in our paper, we also have uh, optimality guarantees. And uh, we show that our estimator is optimal in the sense that it enjoys the tightest confidence bands. Okay. So it's unimprovable in a, in a certain sense. What is the form of sigma squared alpha? Uh, the form of sigma squared alpha. Yes. Good. So this increases as alpha goes to zero. It's observable. This is sigma squared yes, yes, alpha. yes. We have an yeah. estimator for sigma. Uh, and, uh, you can turn this into a pivotal statistics and so on. All right. So now let me demonstrate this idea on a, uh, a real example. So I'm going to look at uh, the effect of enrolling in Medicaid, how that affects doctor's visits. Okay. So Medicaid, as most of you know, right, it's a uh, government uh, insurance subsidy program for low-income adults. And one of the major outcomes that people are interested in is whether it actually allows people access to good health care. Okay? And it's a major piece of policy action costing around uh, $550 billion every year. Right? So we need to really ensure that this is a policy that's working properly. Right? So as one outcome, we're going to look at uh, whether people went to the doctor's office in the last two weeks where the survey date was randomly chosen so that the respondents couldn't manipulate their uh, visit days. But there could still be confounding because our treatment is whether you enroll uh, in Medicaid or not, right? So we control for a rich set of covariates. And uh, today we're going to take the viewpoint of an analyst in 2009, so about 13 years ago, right, who's contemplating the details of the Medicaid expansion at the national scale. Okay? So now we all live in 2009. Now, what is problematic? Well, we want this policy to have an enduring effect, but these demographics, they can actually change a lot in the course of 10 years, right? So in the 10 years following 2009, here I'm just plotting some basic uh, demographic proportions in uh, the US Census West region. And here you can see that the proportion of Hispanics decreased quite a bit, and the proportion of college-educated folks uh, increased quite a bit, okay? So big changes can happen in, in 10 years. Now, based on 2009 data alone, right, we want to look at whether enrolling in Medicaid has a causal effect or not. Right? And here, first, I'm just going to look at the average case. This is my doubly robust estimator for the AT. Right? And here you can see that your treatment effect is positive and statistically significant. Okay? So this aligns with previous findings. But then, if you look at whether this has effects on subpopulations, right? if you increase the subpopulation size alpha, then you can see that this treatment effect disappears even for populations that comprise 80% of the study. 
So it really calls into question how robust this result is. So it really says that this worst case procedure, that a more close uh, investigation of this is necessary. Okay. And indeed, if you plot the treatment effects over time, then you can see that it actually varies quite uh, wildly, and it even becomes negative in, in 2017. Any questions on the first part of this talk? Very high dimensional set of covariates you are controlling for, like in, in this case. Good. And I don't know how what the number of data points is, but do you think it could be too conservative? Like you yes. Only think That's an excellent point. Covariates. Yes, for sure. Uh, so here, for an RCT, I can use a subset of the axes to define my worst case measure, uh, and that uh, effectively addresses this problem in the sense that uh, then I'm really defining this only over. Uh, specific types of covariate shifts I care about. Um, but then, uh, more generally for observational studies, the, the case is actually a bit more subtle. Uh, and and, and uh, yeah, there's a lot to be said here. It's a good point. Do you, did I ask another question? Yeah, yeah of I, course. Um, I guess maybe the, the simple baseline that, that people do is that you control the covariates by running a linear regression on the treatment effect, and then you, you observe the coefficient and try to see what's positive or negative, what would doing that give you here? Like, does it help you identify the subpopulations? Does it sort of agree with what, what you'll find? So it's a regular causal analysis? Yeah. So that's, that's what this is. Oh, um, yeah, I guess like if you try to regress to many facts and, and the covariates, you might find that maybe whether you're Hispanic and not college educated has like a very high coefficient. Ah, good, good. Well, so, so then you need to fundamentally include all the interaction variables across demographic variables and treatment effects, right? And then that usually becomes pretty prohibitive. So in recent days, most people now opt for just using a black box ML model to predict the outcomes, and that somehow adaptively smooths between these covariates, right? And, and then uh, because that automatically accounts for heterogeneity, uh, then you can either look at the average case outcome uh, by averaging this out, or uh, you can restrict to certain subgroups. And this is essentially a more sophisticated version of, of the subgroup analysis. So you mentioned that this line like, crosses zero at around 80, that alpha was 80%. Um, can we interpret that to say that only 20% of individuals were helped by this policy, or is that not like, a valid interpretation? That's a reasonable interpretation. Not exactly mathematically accurate, but I, I think that is quite reasonable. So it really means that uh, this is very effective for a very small number of people, and then not that effective for the majority of the population. And this might have been a question was asked earlier, but I, I come from right here. Is, does this analysis let you say, like, who was helped or hurt? Ah, good. Um, yes, in the sense that uh, you can, thank you, uh, look at the worst case measure here. So the, the Q obtaining the supremum, and you can try to interpret this. Now, this actually leads to uh, criticisms and, and potential research directions here in the sense that Q star, the thing that attains the arc max, in some sense really needs to be interpretable at the end of the day. And if it isn't, then this might mean that this is uh, too conservative a notion to, to require performance over, right? So in this case, you might need to put in more constraints on Q. And I don't think we as a community talk about this that much, how to think about more structured distribution shifts. And I think there's a ton of really interesting problems here notions of uncertainty on the, the worst case uh, effect, but have you also put those kind of notions of uncertainty on like the actual kind of cutoffs of X that the Q, um, uh, Sorry, I'm not sure. Like, um, you can say, you know, there is, an, there is some 80% of this distribution that, that is maybe uh, like not helped by this, by this treatment, but, um, and, and then you have error bars on that. Mm -hmm. um, do you also have some notion of uncertainty on like, how certain I am that it is this 80% versus this other 80%? Uh, um, or to a reasonable degree in the sense that I can try to estimate the arc math here, and then our procedure explicitly gives you an estimator. Uh, there are subtleties because this is a pretty high dimensional object. So it's not something you can really reliably estimate, and that's why we're doing all these fancy debiasing ideas and the proof results in some complex 20 page thing. Um, so, yeah, to some extent, yes. Uh, but if you have, say, 50-dimensional continuous variables, then this is going to be challenging. 
Thanks. Just generically, how confident can I be in the confidence set with that? Uh, because what do you mean by that? It's asymptotic, the uh, mm -hmm. sigma square. Mm -hmm. uh, sigma square alpha. Good, good. Uh, the, the, back to the question I was asking earlier, the sigma squared alpha, uh, it doesn't feel like it depends just on alpha, right? Oh, yes, so, the, so, right. so in our paper, so it depends on the good, good. population. Good, good. Okay. So the first point I want to make there is that as alpha decreases, certainly we're measuring the treatment effect over very small populations, right? So your uncertainty bars are going to blow up. Now, this blows up depending heavily on the noise uh, inherent noise in the potential outcomes. Let me quantify this. Now, the way these uh, calculations are often used is to uh, calculate the minimum detectable effect size uh, under a particular setting, and it's used for experiment design. So how much money should I spend to collect this uh, amount of samples? Right? So it can now uh, inform, OK, if I want to guarantee good performance over alpha fraction of the study population, how many samples do I need? Right? So you, you can sort of do some of these uh, back of the envelope calculations. But of course, the more interesting bit is uh, on whom should we sample, and I think that's a uh, subsequent topic. OK, um, good. So now I'm going to move on to uh, unobserved confounders. Kevin. Uh, can you go back to the? Sure. Uh, this one? One more. One more. One more. There we go. Um, or actually, this is three more over QL. All right. <laughs> there we go. Uh, it, is the right way to think about this in practice, like how actually performing this optimization, are you really just uh, defining some subset of the support of X? And then, like, is that what you're doing? You're just trying to find Good. some set of the domain and then integrating over that? Yes. So here, if you think about X as a subset of the features that you truly care about, right, um, then you have some very complicated functional that you fitted. And then I'm essentially trying to average over that under some worst case distribution. OK, so, so that seems like that could be really wild. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, in practice, it could be. Yes. actually fit in this example, do you, what, what is that function actually? Do? How do you parameterize that? How do you actually perform this optimization? Well, so, so mu of x is something that I'm going to fit using any black box ML method following best practices there, right? And then. Now I'm talking about how do I average over this? Uh, no, how do you define uh -huh. g of x? How do you actually do this agreement? Oh, so I take the jewel, and uh, I skipped over a whole bunch of de details. Um, but there's a dual formulation to this that essentially searches over a single number. So I can turn this infinite dimensional maximization problem expressing that uh, into a single dimensional minimization problem. For those of you who've seen C-bars, this is simply the form of the C-bar, uh, dual C-bar, right? And uh, it becomes essentially just a one-dimensional optimization problem that can solve pretty easily. It's a convex optimization problem. It's just binary search. And this is because I'm just searching over quantiles. Thank you. So good point to clarify. So now, of course, for, uh, for observational studies, we often have these types of confounding that we need to fundamentally worry about. Okay, so now, in the remaining time I have, uh, I'm going to think about how we can, oh, it should be staying here. Um, I'm going to think about how we can extend this known observed confounding condition. I'm going to stop lying to myself, okay? So I'm going to imagine that I have some unobserved confounding my problem, but I'm going to say it may not have that big an effect on the treatment decisions. And the specific way I'm going to say this is I'm going to say that there is a unobserved variable u that embeds all the confounding in my problem such that once you condition x and u, now you have this conditional independence. Okay, and I can always come up with such a u. Now, the specific way I'm going to say u cannot influence the treatment decisions that much is by saying this odds ratio, the probability of u being treated over not being treated, can only vary by a, at most a factor of gamma, where gamma is just some number larger than 1. If gamma is equal to 1, then this odds ratio can't vary at all, right? So it do doesn't depend on the unobserved confounder, meaning there's no confounding, okay? Now, this is perhaps the most uh, classical notion of unobserved confounding due to Paul Rosenbaum. And uh, by now, there's actually a healthy standard practice in, in applied uh, causal inference communities on essentially running worst-case sensitivity analyses under these types of bounded unobserved confounding models, okay? 
And this model is particularly interpretable in the sense that if you think about a logistic regression model, right now put on your st uh, statistician hats, this logistic regression model, it's going to have some non-parametric function of the observed features x, and then some function of the unobserved variable u. And the way I'm going to say that u cannot impact the treatment decisions that much is by simply saying, oh, the coefficient in this logistic regression model can't be that high. Okay? In particular, it's bounded by log of gamma. And these two formulations are exactly equivalent. Okay? So it's fairly interpretable. Now, under this model of confounding, I'm going to develop these worst case bounds, and I'm going to use scalable ML models to try to estimate it. Okay? But before I go into the details, right, at this point, okay, so this is a model of bounded unobserved confounding, but how do you actually choose the right level of gamma? Well, this is often challenging in practice, right? Turning domain specific intuition into concrete modeling, that's a very challenging task, but it's actually often worth doing in order for us to contextualize the results of a study. So, uh, for example, since doctors themselves are the people making these treatment decisions, they often have a fairly good sense of what the unobserved confounding factors might be. Okay? So, uh, when doctors decide whether or not to admit newborn babies to the ICU, it's impostulated that they look at the visual, ob they uh, take visual observations of the babies to uh, make, take, make these decisions. And by taking, talking to the doctors, researchers have argued that a reasonable range of gamma here is somewhere between three to four. Now, another useful heuristic is to look at increasingly larger values of gamma. And again, your worst case bound crosses zero. This is, for example, what happened in the uh, observational study that found that smoking causes lung cancer. For there to be an unrecorded variable to call into question the findings of the study, this, for example, say an unrecorded hormone, this hormone would have had to make you uh, more likely to smoke by something like nine times more which is a, a number that most people thought was physically impossible. So this really instilled confidence in the result of the study. Okay. Of course, uh, this is not the only model of bounded and observed confounding, but I am going to talk about how we can use a modern scalable estimation approach to do sensitivity analysis here. Now, I'm going to focus on deriving a worst case bound on the conditional mean of y1 given x, because the y0 case is metric. So I'm going to do a personalized uh, sensitivity analysis. Okay. Now this thing has two components, the treated people and the control people. The treated people, I observe y1, so this is estimable from data. So that's fine. But this quantity, when z is equal to zero, I never ever observe y1. <laughs> so I always have zero data for this. Now before, when I lie to myself and assume that y1 is independent of z given x, when there's no one observed confounding, then I can turn this into z equals to one. Now I want to be honest, so I can no longer do this. So now what I'm going to think about, so I'm going to think about this magical likelihood ratio that turns this unobservable distribution into an observable quantity. Okay. Now this likelihood ratio, I don't really know what that is, right? It's fundamentally unobservable, unestimable. But under my gamma-bounded unobserved confounding condition, I can show that it exists. And it can only vary by at most a factor of gamma. So now, under this constraint, I can define this worst case region, worst case uh, bound on this fundamentally unobservable quantity. Right? I have this unobservable quantity, and I'm going to take the infimum over all potential data generating distributions that could have generated my data under the gamma bounded confounding condition. So I'm now going to define this bound as theta of x. And this bound is tight in the sense that uh, there's an example for which equality holds. Okay. I'm going to take this entire thing, copy it over. Okay. Up top, the same result. Now, for each, each person represented by a feature vector x, right, now I have to solve, again, an infinite dimensional minimization problem. Pretty bad. So again, I'm going to take the jewel of this quantity, and I'm going to get a single dimensional maximization problem where I have a monotonic constraint in this variable. So now I've reduced the problem. For each person, I just got to find a root finding. Uh, I just got to solve a root finding uh, problem. Okay. Pretty good. But still, I can't really adaptively smooth over different covariates. And this becomes a big, big problem if x is continuous or high dimensional. So now I want to use flexible ML methods to estimate this quantity. Okay. 
Now, what can ML do for us? Well, these ML prediction models, they're effectively curve-fitting tools in high dimensions under noisy data, right? And the way we do uh, these curve-fitting tasks, right, is by formally taking it into a stochastic optimization problem, where we run first uh, stochastic first-order methods on some model class, and then use uh, model selection techniques to choose the right model capacity and the high performance setting. So now I'm going to imagine a regression problem with a squared loss, right? That's this black dotted line. And I'm going to say, if you overestimate the outcome, I'm going to penalize you more by a factor of gamma. That's what this red loss is. It's very simple if I say it in words, but if you try to write it down in math, it looks a bit weird. But that's all I'm doing, OK? Weighted squared loss. Now, with this new loss, I'm going to look at a stochastic optimization problem, a loss optimization problem. Up top, just a summary of everything I talked about so far, right? Theta is just my worst case bound, and this is my single dimensional dual. And my main result shows that my worst case bound is given by a solution to this weighted loss minimization problem. Okay? So what this allows me to do is I can now parameterize this using any function class of my choosing. Neural nets, random forest, gradient boosted trees. I can do model selection to choose the right model capacity. And this effectively allows me to use any ML method of my choosing to do sensitivity analysis at a personalized level. It's a very nice practical lemma. All right, now I'm going a bit fast because uh, I'm out of time. But uh, so now, given these ML-based estimators of these unobserved worst case bounds, worst case bounds on the unobservable component, right? Now I got to combine them to estimate the worst case bound on the single number, the mean of y1. So again, I'm going to use this debiasing idea. And if you do this, then you can essentially come up with a generalization of the W robust estimator under unobserved confounding. And it's, generali it's a generalization in the sense that it shrinks to this W robust estimator when gamma is equal to 1, when there's no unobserved confounding. OK? So again, it utilizes these scalable ML methods, and it combines them using sophisticated semi-parametric tools so that we get this very nice estimator. And in our paper, we also, uh, our, the explicit form of our estimator it gives you intuition on what the true value of having good prediction models are in causal settings. So it turns out if you can predict things well, if the residuals are small, then the usual estimator that assumes no unobserved confounding is actually quite close to our worst case bound. Okay? So good prediction models actually buy you automatic notions of uh, robustness against unobserved confounding. And uh, again, following that debiasing idea, we can show that even when these ML-based nuisance parameters converge at a slower rate, rate of convergence, our final estimator converges at the CLT rate. Okay? All right. So, so when you say even one ML, you just mean that you could use any universally consistent ML? Uh, okay. Um, so, no, you, we need to assume a rate condition on the nuisance parameters. Okay. And the rate at which you need to converge. Yes. Right, right. So essentially, the sec our d bias estimator has the second order term, and that second order term still needs to go to zero, right? So we need to assume whatever rate we need to to make that go to zero, and usually it, it's going to, yeah. And then, okay, that, that's probably part of it. I was going to ask whether you can quantify, in terms of the rate of convergence of the ML estimator, whether you can quantify... Uh, uh, so, so, so you have the first order rate and the second order rate, and we've effectively elim eliminated the first order rate. So insofar as this Taylor expansion holds, which may not in high dimensions, but if it holds, then I just need to make the uh, second order rate go to zero. Thanks. Okay, now just a brief demonstration. I'm going to look at a sepsis management scenario in the ICU. Sepsis accounts out for actually more than one third of the deaths in US hospitals. Pretty important problem. But if you come up with any ideas on an automated approach to this so that you can free up the clinical care team towards more severe cases, right? there's no way I'm going to test these engineering advances on real people in the ICU. Right? I've got to thoroughly evaluate these ideas on previously collected data. I've got to benchmark them. But the problem with benchmarking decision-making policies right, is that it requires counterfactual reasoning. And this is hard because data from ICUs, they tend to suffer from honest or confounding. For example, patients arrive from the emergency department, they don't have a pre-existing record at the hospital, 
So this leaves a lot of patient-specific import important information unobserved in the subsequent analysis. So we talked to an uh, uh, emergency department physician and learned that, for example, the initial treatment of antibiotics is actually quite confounded. Okay? So motivated by this, we're going to look at uh, a pretty simple simulated setup where we're going to compare two sequential decision policies that differ in terms of their initial decision. One always prescribes antibiotics, the other one doesn't. Okay? And this is uh, motivated by the recent uh, medical literature uh, that debates how to balance the benefits of early treatment versus the risks of overprescription. Now, if you lie to yourself and assume that your study is perfect, right, there's no unobserved confounders, then you can see that prescribing antibiotics, that sounds pretty good, right? So how do you instill confidence in this finding? Well, through our worst case approach, you can see that this finding is valid up to a gamma level of something like six, which is actually a ridiculously high level of confounding here. So this really instills confidence in the robustness of this, uh, this observational result. Okay? So it's a way to contextualize the results. Um, so in sum, uh, these worst case approaches, they have the potential to guard against brittle findings that don't hold under distribution shift. And of course, uh, they're very useful tools for contextualizing the results of a study in some qualitative way, but they're not magical bullets, right? And the way I like to think about this is uh, kind of a intelligent middle ground where on the one end of the spectrum, you have essentially lying to yourself and assuming that your study population is representative and that there are no unobserved confounders. And the other end on the end of the spectrum is to just throw up your hands in the air and just go with your gut, ignoring all the data. Right? And I believe that a lot of these worst case procedures, they have the potential to foster a culture in which we can critically reason about the validity of these findings. And there's certainly a lot of work to be done in this space. All right, so with that, I'll end here. Thanks a lot for your attention and happy to answer any questions. How do the, like, the rates of your estimator or other results depend on the, oh, sorry, how do like, the, the rates of your estimator or other results depend on the dimensionality of the X that you choose? Um, so here, because the tools are fundamentally asymptotic in nature, uh, essentially we really need the Taylor expansion to hold, right? And then most, like 80% of classical statistics is Taylor expansion, right? And, and these error terms, they need to go to zero at the right rate. Uh, and uh, we usually use this for inference, right? To quantify uncertainty. If you're, if you're interested in estimation, then you can exactly try to characterize the dimension dependence uh, through finite sample bounds and so on. Uh, but here, because I actually wanted uncertainty bars, I opted for this. And uh, in the worst case, it's going to be very pessimistic in that we're going to get non permitting bounds uh, and there's going to be an exponential uh, dependence on the dimension. And these dependencies, right, essentially say that the dimension can't be too large so that the Taylor expansions hold and my second order term goes to zero. The way I think about this is because non permitting bounds are often extremely pessimistic. Uh, these theoretical results are, they're reasonable, they're sanity checks, but the procedure themselves, the debiasing idea makes sense, right? Removing the first order bias, so long as the Taylor expansion is kind of okay, this can't hurt. So in that sense, I, I think the estimation approach can still be a useful one, but the theoretical results, they often give uh, pretty pessimistic guarantees. Um, can you explain again how does the gamma provide information about the unobserved potential outcome? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so gamma modulates the extent to which this odds ratio varies. So odds ratios are a very standard quantity, like in logistic regression, right? And I'm going to say this odds ratio it can't be vary too much as a function of the unobserved confounder. It's Actually, yeah, I shouldn't claim, uh, claim credit for this. This is uh, a 20-year-old uh, model of unobserved confounding. And because the uh, biostatisticians are actually quite familiar with odds ratios, this is a, a fairly natural thing to posit in that community, for example. 